you look up the term social climber in a dictionary, you might find a picture of Wallace Simpson. <laughs> of course, I'm only kidding. But Wallace Simpson was, in fact, history's most famous, unapologetic social climber ever. She saw what she wanted and went after it with no remorse. Even if that meant betraying one of her closest friends, cheating on her lower class husband, and turning the whole world against a monarchy. Wallace did not care. She was a very complex figure and also very much a bit of a contradiction. The more you learn about her, the more intriguing her story gets. Many have asked in Britain, how can a woman who looks so average cause so much political chaos? She was no Helen of Troy, but Wallace Simpson had traits about her that was simply enigmatic and captivating. She had charm, charisma, intellect, wit, and a hunger to enjoy the finer things of life. She had a youthful spirit, even in her old age. Any man she wanted, she could get. And of course, that is how she got with the king of the United Kingdom, only to have him step down and relinquish the crown just to be with her. Today's video is definitely a juicy one. We will get into all the details, of course, but I will start with her childhood and some bizarre facts, like her drinking raw juiced meat every morning. Mm. I don't know how I feel about that. Hey friend, welcome to my channel Karina Lude where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars through history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so. And if you're already subscribed, please turn on your notification bell so you never miss an upload. Now, without further ado, let's get into this video. So let's start with her childhood. She was born as Bessie Wallace Warfield in June 19th of 1896. Her entry into this world was anything but ordinary. Her parents, both from wealthy Baltimore families, were living it up at a fancy Pennsylvania resort when Wallace decided it was time to make her grand entrance. Wallace's parents had only been married since November 1895, seven months before Wallace was born, which means there's a good chance she was conceived before they said, I do. Wallace spent her whole life trying to sweep that juicy tidbit under the rug, even claiming her folks got married in June 1895 instead. During that era, it was very scandalous to be born under such conditions, honey, especially in high society. But tragedy struck when Wallace was just a baby. Her dad died of tuberculosis, leaving her and her mom, Alice, in a real bind. They went from high society to nearly broke overnight. Wallace's dad's family did help out, but let's just say they weren't thrilled about it. They treated Wallace and Alice more like charity cases than family. To make matters even worse, there were whispers that Wallace's mom and her uncle Sol were more than just family, if you catch my drift. The rumors were that they were lovers. Some speculated that Wallace's mom got with the uncle for financial security reasons. The family found it disturbing because, after all, that was her late husband's brother. And despite the family cutting them off, Uncle Sol kept Wallace in the lap of luxury, sending her to the poshest school around. Even in grade school, young Wallace was known to be a go-getter, and she had no shortage of guys lining up for her attention. Wallace's mother became very controlling over Wallace's life. She was grooming her to be married into high society and polishing her feminine skills. One bizarre way that showed up was in the diet she chose for Wallace to eat. Nothing compared to the painstaking rituals her mom had her indulge in while living in Baltimore, Maryland, such as drinking a tumbler full of juice from a raw beefsteak every day. According to Wallace's mother, it helped to improve her constitution. And when I say raw meat, Meat. I mean raw meat guys like just raw beef thrown into the blender with a little bit of water she had to drink a large cup of this every morning and Wallace continued this practice even in her old age. Wallace stayed slim because she was OCD about her weight. It is rumored that she weighed herself several times a day. She was the first to try all the latest fad diets and drink heavily. Her diet mainly consisted of booze, water, and hard-boiled eggs. She wasn't the most traditional beauty, but she played to her strengths, using fashion and makeup to emphasize her best features. She knew the power of strong red lips, and other things Simpson did was emphasize her eyebrows to frame her face. Wallace was a student of simplicity and knew that being well-groomed, despite how you looked, could get you really far. She also was a student of the upper class and affluent society. She learned all their ways and how to keep the interests of people in social situations. She was a great conversationalist. Her mother really did do a great job of 
training her. Rumors abound that she had gained knowledge of an erotic nature in the Orient. And what is that is basically, you know, sex magic. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. Alice knew if she wanted to keep living the good life, she needed to marry well. So she did what any ambitious socialite would do. She became a debutante and aimed to throw the bash of the year. But Uncle Saul, in a move that was cold as ice, publicly announced he wouldn't be paying for any party because of the ongoing war in Europe. Not one to stick around where she wasn't celebrated, Wallace left and went to Pensacola, Florida, to visit her cousin Corinne. That's where she met Earl Winefield Spencer Jr., a dashing Navy pilot. He wasn't old money, but he had potential. And more importantly, he was smitten with Wallace. After a whirlwind romance, they tied the knot in November 1916. Wallace Simpson's honeymoon in West Virginia was supposed to be all about romance and new beginnings, but instead it turned into the opening scene of a marriage thriller. Her husband Spencer had a secret that bubbled up to the surface. The man loved alcoholic beverages. He was an alcoholic. Navy rules were strict about not drinking before flying, so he would trick and put like, would put vodka or, you know, martinis into soup bowls and act like he was drinking soup, but instead he was actually drinking. Him and his friends would do that. He would go through great lengths to hide his drinking. Life with Spencer wasn't the glamorous party Wallace had envisioned. Sure, their social circles were popping with parties and Navy shindigs, but those gatherings had a dark undertone. Wallace, being the life of every party, didn't shy away from dancing and flirting with other men, a habit that was all fun and games back in Baltimore. But Spencer? Not so much. The guy was seething with jealousy, locking Wallace up at home whenever he went out. One time, he even locked her in the bathroom for hours. His drinking got worse, culminating in a horrifying incident where he crashed his plane into the ocean while drunk. Miraculously, he survived, but their marriage was on a crash course of its own. The couple moved around a lot because of Spencer's job, which somehow kept their marital issues under wraps. When they ended up in California, Wallace had a brush with royalty at a party attended by Prince Edward. Edward, the future king of England. But back then, their interactions was nothing memorable, at least not to Edward. Wallace took one look at him, though, and knew that she wanted him. But that would take years before she would get to see him again. And sometimes, who you knows, your future spouse, you might have stumbled upon them one time and then don't see them again until years later. But the plant, the seed was planted, okay? Washington, D.C. was a breath of fresh air for Wallace. She was back to living her dreams, parties, friends, and the high life. But then Spencer got stationed in Hong Kong. Refusing to go with him, she stayed behind and started an affair with an Argentine diplomat. It was hot and heavy, but ultimately doomed. The man wanted a wealthy wife, and Wallace living off a Navy allowance didn't fit the bill. Their marriage became a cycle of breakups and makeups, and during one of their off periods, Wallace traveled through China, partying and staying with wealthy friends. In Beijing, she got involved with an Italian diplomat and ended up pregnant. Terrified of scandal, she went and terminated the pregnancy, but the procedure went horribly wrong, leaving her infertile. Back in the U.S., Wallace was determined to end her marriage for good, and despite the shock and disapproval from her family, she was set on getting a divorce. Knowing the law, of the time, she found a loophole in Virginia. All she needed was to live there for a year, so she checked into a hotel and waited it out, ready to close this chapter of her life. But Wallace wasn't one to sit around moping. During a visit with friends, she dusted off her heartbreak and set her sights on Ernest Aldrich Simpson. There was just one teensy problem. He was still married, and his wife was none too pleased about Wallace waltzing into their lives. Later, his ex would claim Wallace wrecked her life and took everything from her. Fast forward a few weeks post-divorce, and bam, Wallace became Miss Simpson, barely seven months after her divorce was finalized. With Ernest, Wallace hit the jackpot. They moved to London, where she got schooled by her sister-in-law on how to schmooze with the upper crust, memorizing royals like flashcards. Both Wallace and Ernest were hungry for the high life. They were both social climbers, clawing their way up the social ladder. But keeping up with the Joneses, or should we say the Windsors, started to drain Ernest's wallets. He was spending a lot of money, and he really didn't have it like that, but he kept up appearances very well. Enter Edward, the future king, who was already playing the field with Thelma, Lady Furnes. But when Edward met Wallace, sparks didn't exactly fly, at least not at first. But after just one conversation with Wallace, he was smitten by her sass and wit and was head over heels. Edward became a regular at the Simpsons' dinner parties, 
so much so that it sparked rumors. Even when Thelma came back to town, she noticed Edward was giving her the cold shoulder, all googly-eyed over Wallace instead. And mind you, Wallace became good friends with Thelma and cozied up to her so that she could get closer to Edward. Thelma, in her ignorance, really thought that Wallace was indeed a true friend, but Thelma was just one step for Wallace to climb up that ladder. Moral of the story... Well, you guys can comment below what you think the moral of the story is. I'm curious to see the different takes, but mm, be careful of your friends, honey. As Edward and Wallace became inseparable, poor Ernest and Thelma were clueless about the brewing storm. Despite keeping it strictly G-rated in public, the rumor mill was hot with whispers of an affair. And when Edward started draping Wallace in jewels left by his late grandmother, well, that was a smoking gun. People weren't just whispering about an affair, they were practically shouting it from the rooftops. Wallace Simpson's life was like being stuck in the middle of the juiciest gossip column you can imagine. High society folks couldn't stop chattering about her, throwing around nasty whispers like, what does he see in her? They were convinced she must have had some wild tricks up her sleeve to snag the prince because, let's be real, they thought she was too masculine, far from a beauty queen. The rumors got so out of hand that some even thought she was a man in disguise. And, and that Edward was gay and Wallace was helping him live his fantasy. Imagine that. Then as if the rumor mill wasn't already spinning out of control, a big shot from London's police force claimed he dug up dirt on Wallace. According to him, she was playing her husband and her royal beau for fools, all while sneaking around with another guy. Meanwhile, her husband acted like he was totally clueless about the whole mess. But come on, he had to have known something was up, but he was such a social climber himself that he turned a blind eye to it all. Fast forward to January 1936, and King George V dies. Prince Edward steps up as King Edward VIII, and who's right there with him? You guessed it, Wallace Simpson. She was even hanging out at St. James Palace when they shouted from the rooftops that Edward was the new king. Despite the British media keeping quiet about their love affair, it it was the worst kept secret around the globe. Wallace knew she needed to ditch her current hubby if she wanted to keep the love train rolling with Edward. Conveniently enough, Ernest Simpson started cozying up to Mary Raffray, one of Wallace's old friends. Since the Church of English was super strict about divorce, only cheating could get you out of a marriage. So Ernest was caught, quote unquote, red handed in a hotel room with Raffray. So rumor has it that Ernest and Raffray were in on it with Wallace and Edward. They intentionally got caught so that the public wouldn't frown on their divorce. Since Ernest was already in debt for trying to keep up with the Joneses, he was paid off to quietly take the fall for infidelity. What do you guys think? The whole affair made waves, earning Wallace and Edward some serious side eye from the conservative British parliament and pretty much every British colony out there. Edward tried his best to bring Wallace into his kingly world, despite his family throwing shade and calling her that woman. He was dead set on making her his queen. But the bigwigs in Australia, Canada, and South Africa were having none of it. Then bam, the English newspaper hit the stands with grave constitutional crisis, plastered on the front page, stirring up a storm about Wallace, the twice-divorced American who stole the king's heart. The general public, just catching wind of this drama, was both shocked and ticked off. Protests exploded outside Wallace's doorsteps, with some folks even threatening her life. Despite having royal guards on her side, the situation got so dicey that Wallace had to hatch an escape plan. Teaming up with one of the king's mates, Wallace made her escape not knowing it would be nearly three years before she stepped foot on English soil again. Wallace Simpson's arrival in France was nothing short of a hot mess. She lands hoping to slip under the radar, but the king, her beloved Edward, botched up the paperwork for her passport and car. They had this whole incognito plan with a fake name and everything, but it all fell apart. The French officials were like, aren't you, you know? There's only one way Edward can keep his crown. And it was all on her. She had to leave him. So they shoot out this press release from Cairns, basically saying Wallace would bow out if she was causing too much drama. Like she was dumping Prince Edward via front page news, okay? The newspaper ate it up, hinting that the royal crisis was done and dusted. But they were wrong. Edward, not one to sit around, had already made up his mind. Before Wallace's ink was even dry, he announced he was ditching the throne for love. Just like that, he planned to abdicate, passing the king baton to his brother, George VI. This was earth-shattering stuff. Royal bombshells don't get bigger than this. After the abdication, Wallace and Edward didn't exactly ride off into a fairy tale ending. 
They became the poster couple for scandal, living under a microscope. Trust issues, they had them in spades. Convinced their so-called friends were just waiting to spill their secrets for a quick buck. They were finally free to marry, though. Edward left the palace and went to stay with his good friends, Rothschilds. And if you know anything about that family, then that's all I will say. While Wallace was busy planning the wedding of the century, Edward was being a total diva at the Rothschilds, acting all shocked whenever someone dared to show him a bill. Now the prince, who never had to pay for anything, all of a sudden has to figure out how banking systems worked. Despite snagging the Duke title, the royal cash flow was more of a trickle, leaving Edward scrambling for funds. He no longer had the lavish access that he once had. The public was still very much Team Edward, thanks to his heartfelt goodbye speech, while Wallace was seen as a villain in their royal soap opera. But hey, everyone loves a good comeback story. Their wedding, though snubbed by Edward's family, was a hit. Wallace stunned everyone in a chic blue dress, giving the world the happy ending it craved. Wallace Simpson finally married her prince. But let's just say the royal welcome mat wasn't exactly rolled out. King George VI dubbed her the Duchess of Windsor, but drew the line at her royal highness. The snub didn't just irk Edward. Wallace was livid too. At their plush home, she had the staff call her her royal highness, a cheeky middle finger to the official decree. Their honeymoon, they hopped on a train owned by none other than Benito Mussolini. Mm, and if you know anything about that. So while gallivanting through Italy, Edward wasn't just sightseeing. He was caught on camera throwing up fascist salutes. The scandal meter was off the charts. Next up, the States. Charles Badeau, a man whose reputation was muddier than a rainy day at a festival, footed the bill for their grand American tour. But America wasn't having any of it. Protests erupted, the first lady gave them the cold shoulder, and a British ambassador practically begged them to leave the, the United States. And they had no job opportunities. The scandal of their union made them unwanted everywhere they went. Stuck in a sort of limbo, they floated from one holiday to the next, crashing at friends' houses. Gone were the days of potential and possibility. Now they were just drifting aimless. Then as if their choices couldn't get any better, any more questionable, they took up a dough on another offer, a trip to meet Adolf Hitler. There they were, you know, hanging out with Hitler with Edward chatting away in German and Wallace throwing out hell Hitlers like confetti, clueless to the conversation. Back home, the royal family was ready to disown them twice over. Rumors swirled that Wallace was a secret German agent sent years ago to throw a wrench in the monarchy. Talk about a plot twist. As World War II loomed and the Germans marched on Paris, Wallace and Edward beat it out of there, eventually landing in Portugal. That's when Edward finally snagged a royal gig, governor of the Bahamas. Finally, a sense of purpose. He finally got a job, y'all. Wallace threw herself into the role of governor's wife, but her comments on the locals? Yikes. Let's just say she wouldn't win any popularity contests. She was very racially insensitive. And her shopping sprees in the U.S. during Britain's darkest hours also was not a great look. Wallace and Edward had a dark history of being racially ignorant, to say the least. And a trip to Barbados, Edward was just insufferable. He complained he was having a miserable and loathsome time and described the tropical paradise as a bum place. The royal playboy reported the local scenery as being ugly and he found the colored population to be revolting. He moaned, I can't and shan't be able to raise the least enthusiasm about anything on this trip. It looks a proper bum island, this Barbados. It's a unique sort of scenery, very ugly, and I don't take much to the colored population who are revolting. End quote. I can't believe he's talking about Rihanna's island like that. <sighs> Come on, it gave us Rihanna. The disrespect. He held as much disdain for the Bahamas as he did for Barbados, calling the island which he governed a third-class British colony. In the 1920s, he was also quoted expressing his disgust for the indigenous aboriginals during a tour of Australia. He is reported to have said, They are the most revolting form of living creatures I have ever seen. They are the lowest known form of human being and are the nearest things to monkeys. End quote. Edward's true dark nature, however, was no secret to the royal family. The church or the parliament, everyone close to Edward knew that beyond his charming facade, he was utterly unfit to rule. Caught in Edward's fierce obsession, she became the perfect scapegoat for those who wished to dethrone the troubled king. Through it all, Wallace seemed resigned to playing the villain. 
After all, she's been doing it since the day she and Edward first locked eyes. It is because according to a new book, That Woman by Anne Seba, Wallace never expected her affair to go so far and certainly never wanted Edward to abdicate. He convinced her that if she left him, he could not go on. King taking his own life over a love affair would taint the royal family more than the alternative. She agreed to marry him. This information came to the author by way of unpublished letters between Wallace and her second husband, Ernest Simpson. They were on more than good terms throughout Ernest's cooked up affair to end the marriage and allowed Wallace her freedom to marry Edward. Wallace confided her thoughts to Ernest, all the while making sure he was doing okay. The letters were kept in the family and only recently revealed by Ernest's now elderly son with his wife after Wallace. War is over and our duo decides to ditch the Bahamas for a life that sounds like it's straight out of a fancy magazine. They're all about jet setting, splurging in posh stores, and rubbing elbows with the creme de la creme of the cafe society. Think endless parties, long brunches, and the kind of gossip that keeps everyone whispering. But despite all the glam, they kind of lost their royal bojo and ended up being those people who always say the wrong things at the wrong time, and they weren't really very likable. Thanks to their frosty vibes with the royal family, they missed out on big family moments back home like Elizabeth II getting married and George VI health going downhill. And fast forward and George VI dies. Edward outlives his brother and even their mom, Mary of Tech, who seriously couldn't stand Wallace. Edward shows up solo to his brother's funeral, leaving Wallace out in the cold. She was not invited. The 1950s roll around and Wallace moves to New York City. As the 50s wind down, both Wallace and Edward are racking up hospital miles. Him for his health going south, her for her little nip and tuck. She loves surgery, but Wallace, she's still the life of the party. In 1972, Elizabeth II plans a visit to France and decides to drop by Wallace and Edward Place. Edward's on his last leg after surgery, and everyone's feeling pretty somber. Ten days post-royal visit, Edward dies at 77. Wallace is now all alone. But here's the kicker. After Edward's death, the royal family finally throws Wallace a bone. Queen Elizabeth sends her condolences, flies Edward's body back to England, and even invites Wallace to Buckingham Palace for the funeral. At the funeral, Wallace was all over the place, leading some folks to whisper that she might have been tranquilized just to get through it. And then in a moment that was equal part heartbreaking and awkward, after the ceremony, she thanked the prime minister and invited him to visit Paris. She said, the Duke and I would so love to have you. After Edward's death, Wallace was like a sheep without a sailor. She started selling off properties and stuff, worrying nonstop about cash. But that wasn't the only thing on her mind. Wallace began forgetting friends' names and would often seem confused or just ramble aimlessly. Dementia had taken hold and it was brutal. By 1978, Wallace was basically living in her bed, a shadow of the social butterfly she once was. Her lawyer, Suzanne Bloom, took control of her life. But let's just say Bloom wasn't winning any Lawyer of the Year awards. She lied to the press, sold off Wallace jewels on the cheap to her buddies, and basically made a mess of Wallace's finances. By the time Wallace died in 1986, a lot of her treasures were long gone. Wallace's funeral was something else. The Queen, the Queen Mother, Prince Philip, Prince Charles, and Princess Diana all showed up. It was like the royal reunion that Wallace and Edward never got in real life. This is all I have for this story. What a story, right? Comment below your thoughts. I you know, started to be a fan of Wallace. And then as I got deeper into it, I was like, oh, and being racially insensitive was just a no for me. But I want you guys to comment below the moral of the story. For me, not all things that glitter is gold. <laughs> I love you guys so much. Thank you for tuning in. If you like the music you're listening to, the link is in the description. Comment below. Who else would you guys like me to add to my list? Catch you on the next one.